Farina Mir, who I met um, in graduate school <laughs> at Columbia University, where she also received her PhD. And I was just beginning when uh, I met her, and she was finishing up her doctoral research at that time. So she's uh, far advanced than I. <laughs> Um, she is currently assistant professor of history at the University of Michigan, <clears throat> where she teaches courses on early modern and modern South Asia. She holds degrees in English and Asian and Middle Eastern languages and cultures from Barnard College and in history from Columbia University, as I said, and she received her PhD in 2002. Trained as a historian of colonial and post-colonial South Asia, her work focuses mainly on the history of the Punjab. Her book is entitled The Social Space of Language, Vernacular Culture in British Colonial Punjab, <clears throat> and it will be published this year from the University of California Press. It's a study of the Punjabi literary tradition during the colonial period from 1849 to 1947 with a particular focus on kisse or epic stories or romances. She's published, um, in addition to her forthcoming book, she's published related essays in uh, Comparative Studies in Society and History and the Indian Economic and Social History Review. So it's a real honor to have someone like her with us. Um, and it's uh, somewhat intentional that we're inviting kind of younger scholars um, last year and this year um, in order to kind of show you who's, who's new um, on the, in the field of Punjab studies, Punjabi literary studies, Punjabi historical studies, um, and to show you how much interest there is, how much energy there is in this field, and it's something to be excited about. So I hope you'll all be as excited as I am to welcome Professor Mir to our uh, event. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anne, for that introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I really appreciate everyone taking time out on this Saturday afternoon to uh, come out in the cause of uh, both Punjabi and to celebrate, uh, you know, uh, to celebrate a mother, which is very, very touching. So, um, do you need me to speak up? It's usually, gonna... usually not a problem, but I can definitely, okay, thank you. So, um, my talk today is titled The Punjabi Literary Formation, Language and Affect in a Vernacular Culture. So I'd like to open my talk today with a story, if I may. Known as Heer Ranja, and often simply as Heer, it's a love story about a young man named Dido. Dido from, from Takht Hazara. Let me see if I can get this to work. Maybe not. So known as Heer Ranja and often simply as Heer, this is a love story about a young man named Dido from Takht Hazara, a village in the Punjab. Dido, invariably referred to as Ranja, the name of his Zat, which I translate as caste or kinship group, was the son of a landowner who left his natal village in search of the renowned beauty named Heer when denied his share of an inheritance upon his father's death. Through a harrowing journey, Ranja made his way to Heer's hometown of Jung, where the two fell in love at first sight. Their love blossomed on the banks of the Chenab River, while Ranja, although from a family of high social standing, worked as a lowly cowherd for Heer's father. The young lover's idol came to an end, however, when her parents learned of the relationship. Appalled and socially disgraced by her behavior, Heer's parents, parents forced her to marry someone they considered more suitable. Now, in the meantime, Ranja, brokenhearted, retreated to a monastery at Tilajogian. And for those of you who know the Punjab, you know that's in the Salt Range Mountains. And at Tila Jogiya, Ranja took on the outward trappings of a yogi and then made his way to Heer's married home in Rangpur in a bid to elope with her. Aha. Sometimes the story ends with our forcibly parted lovers reunited and living happily ever after. More often, however, this tale ends in tragedy with Heer and Ranja in agony over their separation, dying for their love. Now this deceptively simple love story, part epic, part romance, and almost certainly fictional, has circulated in the Punjab orally and textually since at least the 16th century. But its longevity alone is not what makes this narrative tradition interesting. Rather, it's that it surfaces repeatedly in Punjab's history in places one would least expect to find it. Consider the following. <clears throat> 
In 1849, Ganesh Das completed his Jar Baghi Punjab, a Persian language history of his native Punjab from earliest antiquity to its annexation by the English East India Company that year. Primarily a political history of the Sikh kingdom that immediately preceded the British, the Jar Baghi Punjab also gave a detailed account of many of the cities, towns, and villages of the region. Nestled in the middle of this geographic account and political history is an extensive description of love stories. Among them, Hiranja. To the contemporary reader, these romances, all of them kese, a genre of epic romance, seem more than a little out of place in a text otherwise devoted to recounting a conventional history. Their inclusion is no accident, however, which begs the question, why were these romances, these kise, relevant to writing the Punjab's history? Colonial rule would last almost 100 years in the Punjab, and the political settlement that brought an end to empire in India also precipitated a tragedy of immense proportions, the partition. As is well known, and I need not recount that history here, the Punjab was the site of intense violence in which as many as one million people died. Amrita Pritham captured the anguish of that historical moment in her Punjabi poem, Tavadis Shah. And Pritham wrote, and I, I quote, today I call on Vadis Shah from beyond the grave speak and turn today a new page in the book of love once wept a daughter of the Punjab, a clear reference to Heer. Your pen unleashed a million cries. A million daughters weep today. To you, Vadis Shah, they turn their eyes." End quote. In evoking the violence and tragedy of Punjab's partition, Amrita Pritham turned to Vadis Shah, an 18th century Punjabi poet whose rendition of Heer Ranja became the standard against which all other renditions were measured and one which continues to enthrall audiences to this day. What did Vadis Shah signify to Amrita Pritham? And why did she use Hiranja as a metaphor in her lament on the crisis suffered by the people of Punjab in 1947? Through my research, I have attempted to answer these questions by examining Punjabi language, oral, and literary traditions, focusing on the Qissa, the principal genre in which he Ranja was composed and the dominant genre of Punjabi literary production from the 17th through the early 20th centuries. My aim has been to understand the continuing vitality and significance of this tradition under colonialism, when the Punjabi language, and I would argue by extension its literature, were marginalized, if not actively suppressed by the colonial state. Despite this, however, both the language and its literature thrived. Part of the reason for this, as suggested by my opening anecdotes, is because Punjabi language and literature were central to constructing and narrating historical imaginations in colonial Punjab. Yet, notwithstanding this evident centrality, Punjabi, the context in which it was used, and its literary traditions have not figured prominently in scholarly understandings of Punjab's, of colonial Punjab's society at large. Now, I've spent a lot of time wondering why this would be the case, the centrality of Punjabi and, yes, and yet its absence in the literature or the scholarly literature on colonial Punjab. And I would argue that it is undoubtedly because historians have never considered the Punjabi language an adequate foundation for a cross communal regional culture. The assumption has perhaps been that a language written in two scripts, Gurmukhi and Indo-Persian or Shamukhi, historically spoken by members of three religious communities, Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, and indeed Christian as well, so we could say four, but appropriated for political purposes by one of those communities, the Sikh community, a language today divided between the two nation states of India and Pakistan, I would argue that all of this has, has suggested to historians um, that Punjabi was scattered across too many social and political fault lines to ever cohere uh, 
as a ground for ethno-linguistic communal claims. The absence of claims to Punjabi ethno-linguistic nationalism has led to a pervasive, if implicit, conclusion in existing scholarship, whether that scholarship is on colonial or post-colonial Punjab, that there was little affect for the Punjabi language beyond the Sikh community, the community with which the language is most closely associated. My work suggests, however, that the role of language and literature in constituting a religiously plural regional culture, what I refer to as Punjab's vernacular culture, remains vital, even in the absence of linguistic nationalism. And that indeed, the putatively natural relationship between language, literature, and nation must itself be questioned. The vigorous 19th century print culture of Punjabi literature that I will speak about today did not, for example, magically produce a nationalist politics. That we must re-examine the relationship between language and nation is particularly true for imperial or colonial settings, and for that matter, post-colonial settings, where language itself, and usually one particular language, is often implicated in the project of state consolidation, leading other linguistic traditions, as was the case with Punjabi under colonialism, being pushed to the margins, and therefore the margins of history. So I would like to suggest that the Punjab is a particularly compelling context for exploring the relationship between language, state, and society. Now this is because the Punjab provides us a regional rather than a national context for understanding broader themes in modern South Asia, or in the history of modern South Asia. Punjab's colonial history allows for a reassessment of the impact of colonialism, for example, or of the penetration of nationalist imaginaries. Annexed by the East India Company in 1849, after two bitter wars with the Sikh kingdom of Lahore, the Punjab was among the last regions to be incorporated into British India. It was administered by a colonial state that was at the height of its power, a power exercised through well-established bureaucratic, financial, judicial, and military arms of the state. The Punjab thus provides an excellent understanding or an excellent um, setting for understanding both the dramatic effects of colonial control on indigenous society and the limits of that same control. Now, the Punjab was also a province in British India in which three major religious communities each constituted significant parts of the population. Now, to give us some sense of what we're talking about in terms of demographics, if we, if we look at the statistics in the 1901 Imperial Gazetteer, which recorded approximately 24 million inhabitants for the Punjab, what we find is that approximately 49% at the time were Muslim, 41% were Hindu, and 9% were Sikh. And we can actually, based on other people's scholarship, we can actually say that the Sikh proportion was likely significantly higher than this because of the nature of colonial census production, underplayed Sikh representation. But my point here is we're talking about three major religious communities in this region. Now, while this religious plurality created what we would today call a multicultural society, during the colonial period, religious identity was often a point of political and social conflict in this region, as elsewhere in North India and beyond, conflict which many see as culminating in India's partition in 1947. Now, notwithstanding the importance of religious identity and community to the history of colonial Punjab and India more generally, I would suggest that a continuing scholarly emphasis on religious difference between, uh, that the continuing scholarly emphasis on religious difference has left the many points of interaction and exchange that existed between the Punjab's inhabitants relatively unexplored. I would describe my work as an attempt to redress this by focusing on an aspect of Punjabi society shared by all of its members, its vernacular culture. Today, I will discuss three aspects of the Punjabi language and its literature under colonialism. The first is the colonial context in which the Punjabi language functioned. Second is the Punjabi literary formation of my title. 
And third is what I call the spatial imagination embedded in colonial era Punjabi kisse. Now, in turning to the colonial context, let me begin by considering the colonial production of knowledge about the Punjabi language. Now, this knowledge was produced by both missionaries and East India Company officials from the turn of the 19th century on. Missionary interest in Punjabi stemmed from a more general commitment to mapping and learning Indian vernacular languages as a means to propagate Christianity most effectively among the indigenous population. Now, through their mapping, and this map, by the way, is by uh, the Serampore missionaries. It's the earliest language, what we call language map. It's the earliest known language map for uh, the modern period. It dates from 1822. And what missionaries did was try and figure out what languages were spoken where in India, right? So through their mapping, missionaries identified Punjabi and related dialects as spoken in Northwest India. And this gives us a close-up of that Northwest area. They then produced philological materials for Punjabi. So for example, the Serampore missionary, William Carey, produced the first modern grammar for Punjabi in 1812. And as soon as was feasible, they translated and published millions of pages, and I mean literally millions of pages of, Chris, of Christian scripture in the language, all of it in the Gurmukhi script. Now, an important aspect of missionary conceptions of Punjabi, as suggested by their publishing program in particular, is that they singularly associated Punjabi with the Gurmukhi script and with the region's Sikh community. Indeed, so close was the association that in the early half of the 19th century, missionary writings used Punjabi and Sikh interchangeably. Now, the relationship between Punjabi and the Sikh tradition is important and historically grounded. I think we all know that, though not in quite the way that missionaries thought. Missionaries identified Punjabi as the colloquial language of most Sikhs, and this was undoubtedly true. And I kind of like this map for giving us a sense. This is a distribution of uh, religious traditions in India around 1909, and this shows us the concentration of Sikhs via information taken from the census, and as is commonsensical, the greatest concentration is in the Punjab. So when missionaries identified Punjabi as the colloquial or spoken language of Sikhs, this was undoubtedly true. But they also identified Punjabi as the Sikh liturgical language based on their understanding of the Adi Granth, right? Of course, Sikhism's most sacred text. Now, I'll show you. Right here, we have an image from the British Library. Now, the Adi Granth, as I suspect everyone here knows, contains the poetry of the Sikh gurus and other sants, including Kabir, Namdev, Surdas, and Sheikh Farid. Like all Sikh sacred literature, the Adi Granth is recorded in the Gurmukhi script, which had been created by the Sikh gurus in the 16th century to record their Punjabi compositions. But Gurmukhi can be used to record any Indian language. And Sikh sacred literature is not limited to compositions in Punjabi. Again, as everyone here would know, the Namdev's compositions are in Marathi. Indeed, Professor Christopher Shackle of SOAS does not even use the, the term Punjabi to refer to the language of the Adi Granth. He uses a term I've always found very uh, slightly awkward, the sacred language of the Sikhs, or the SLS, right? But the point is that for missionaries, who clearly made this, uh, who identified the Adi Granth as being in Punjabi because it was in the Gurmukhi script. So missionaries were somewhat mistaken in identifying Punjabi alone as the language of Sikh sacred scripture. Where they erred was in conflating the Gurmukhi script with the Punjabi language. Now like missionaries, East India Company officials also turned their attention to Punjab early in the 19th century, spurred by both security and, I would argue, pecuniary interests. The British identified the Punjab with what they referred to as the Sikh nation in particular, 
And of course, this was very logical as in the early 19th century, Ranjit Singh's Sikh kingdom was at the zenith of its power there. As Lieutenant Colonel John Malcolm made clear in his 1812 text, Sketch of the Sikhs, and I quote, although the information I may convey in such a sketch may be very defective, he wrote with false modesty, it will be useful at a moment when every information regarding the Sikhs is of importance, end quote. Malcolm's was not the first colonial study of the Sikhs, but he claimed special authority for his, access to the Adi Granth. With this access, Malcolm drew the same conclusions as his missionary contemporaries, that Punjabi in the Gurmukhi script was the language of the Sikhs. Now my point in raising the set of associations between language, script, and religious community as a colonial misconception is not to suggest that Punjabi was not the language of Sikhs in colonial and pre-colonial Punjab. Rather, my point is that Punjabi was not the language of Sikhs alone. And despite the persistence of the, of the association between Punjabi, the Gurmukhi script, and Sikhs in colonial conceptions of the language, both indigenous and colonial sources from later in the century underscore the fact that in 19th century Punjab, Punjabi was spoken by people of all religious traditions, and that it had a vibrant written tradition in the Indo-Persian script alongside the Gurmukhi tradition. Now, a few examples help illustrate this point. One comes from the colonial official and amateur philologist John Beams, who in his important study, Outlines of Indian Philology, produced a language map of his own. And that language map, this is from the 1860s, by the way, this language map confirmed the information found in the Serampore missionaries map earlier in the century. Punjabi was the language of much of the colonial province of Punjab. Now, Beams's study had been conducted outside his official duties, but in time, the colonial state too developed an active interest in mapping Indian languages. Statistical information on indigenous language practices began to surface from various colonial departments in the 1870s. The administration, administration report of the Punjab for 1873-74, for example, recorded spoken vernaculars in every district of the Punjab and identified Punjabi as the spoken vernacular in every district of central and southern Punjab and a number of other districts in the colonial province as well. So colonial knowledge production and conceptions of Punjabi take on particular significance when we consider colonial language policy. Now, prior to annexation in 1849, the company had adopted a general policy across India to use vernacular languages for provincial administration. This was Act 29 that they passed in 1837. According to its own dictates, when it came to power in Punjab in 1849, the East India Company should have adopted Punjabi as the official language of the province. It did not, however. It first adopted a two-language policy using Persian in the western parts of the province and Urdu in the eastern parts of the province. And this was later changed in the early 1850s to a uniform policy in favor of Urdu. Now, although state-produced data may have come later in the century, it is quite clear that company officials were aware of the linguistic map of the region when they adopted this policy in favor of Persian and ultimately Urdu. In 1849, just as the policy was implemented, John Lawrence, who was head of the new provincial government, wrote, and I quote, it should be considered that the Urdu is not the language of these districts and neither is Persian, end quote. Now, I have argued in an essay on colonial language policy in 19th century India that a number of considerations were at play when the colonial state decided to adopt Urdu rather than Punjabi as the official language of the province. These included administrative continuity with other parts of India where Urdu was already in use, a continuity which allowed the company to employ experienced Indian personnel who had served elsewhere in its Indian empire, particularly from the Northwest provinces, today's UP. But more significant 
then the apparent advantages of using Persian and Urdu and from 1854 Urdu alone were the apparent disadvantages of using Punjabi. And here I would argue the association between Punjabi and the Sikh community becomes very important. Officials feared that adopting Punjabi might promote the claims of its defeated Sikh rivals, of whom it was still wary in, the early years, in its early years in power. Now, despite its victory, or its, vic well, ultimately, I would say victory in the Anglo-Sikh War, the company lacked confidence in its control over the Punjab, particularly as the military of the Sikh kingdom had yet to be completely disarmed. That insecurity is evident in an 1849 report by Charles Napier, commander-in-chief of company forces, who wrote, and again I quote, the Punjab has been occupied by our troops, but it is not conquered. We now occupy it with 54,000 fighting men, and it is at present very dangerous ground, end quote. Now Napier's fears were based on his belief that there were 100,000 Sikh soldiers in the Punjab, Whose, and again, I quote, using his language, he wrote that their courage has no way abated by the last struggle, and he thought that they may someday unexpectedly use it against the company. Now, given its close association between the Punjabi language and Sikhs, the company feared that instituting Punjabi as the language of state would encourage Sikh political aspirations. If political concerns about a Sikh resurgence suggested that Punjabi should be actively suppressed, then colonial attitudes about its lack of merit as a language helped justify such a strategy. Although colonial officials deemed Punjabi a sacred language, this didn't stop them from denigrating the language when it came to considering it for administration. Colo colonial officials had a long list of concerns. They argued that Punjabi was, quote, a mere patois, and thus unsuitable for official communication, i.e. that it wasn't a language but something less than that. They argued that it was not standardized, that it would, quote, be inflexible and barren and incapable of expressing nice shades of meaning and exact logical ideas with the precision so essential in local proceedings, end quote. Of course, anyone who knows Punjabi can only chuckle at these kinds of, uh, what can only call them sort of accusations. Some officials based their arguments against Punjabi on the language's lack of written uniformity. Others erroneously argued that Punjabi could not be written in the Indo-Persian script, something belied by a vibrant manuscript tradition to show you just one example. Now, one official even as asserted that there was no tradition of writing in Punjabi at all. Colonel Hamilton, commissioner of Multan, wrote, and I quote, the Punjabi has never been a written language in the Multan division. It is doubtful whether a man could be procured in the division who could write Punjabi correctly in any character. Now, end quote. I find that one particularly interesting since I found a number of Punjabi texts produced in Multan right at this period. So I don't know where he was hiding. So opting for a language other than Punjabi for administration, courts, and ultimately education was not simply to exercise benign neglect. The colonial record time and again suggests that the state actively sought to replace Punjabi with Urdu, that it sought to precipitate Punjabi's decline and eventual extinction. As one colonial official put it, indelicately, I might add, I quote, the Punjabi is a barbarous dialect, which if left alone, will gradually disappear, end quote. Of course, this celebration itself is a sign that they were off the mark on that and so much more, right? But anyway, in other words, colonial language policy pushed Punjabi to the margins of colonial discourse and institutions. It did not, however, as we all know, cause the language to atrophy, much less die. Now, I want to underscore two distinct aspects of colonial language policy at this juncture. First, that in Punjabi's survival, we have an important limit to colonial rule. And second, an unintended consequence of colonial language policy was that it opened up a space 
for Punjabi to develop a durable presence in arenas largely free from networks of colonial knowledge and power. We have in colonial era Punjabi literature, therefore, a particularly compelling source for understanding contemporary indigenous society. Now, not only did Punjabi survive, but Punjabi literary production flourished in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as evidenced by a prolific publishing industry. Now, again, for those of you who are not familiar, Punjabi commercial publishing began at mid-century. The first commercial press dates from 1850 in Lahore. And it took some time after that to come to sort of get off the ground. But by the 1870s, Punjabi publishing was very well established in the Punjab. By the 1880s, it was thriving. In 1887, for example, colonial records point to 473 titles published in the language. Each of these titles had a print run of anywhere from 100 to 2,400 copies. So what this means is that by the 1880s, tens of thousands of Punjabi books were in circulation in the Punjab. And this number is rather astonishing since the literacy rate in the Punjab never went above officially, never went above even 5%. So what we have is clearly a very rich and vital tradition being sustained by Punjabi speakers. Now, kisse were an important aspect of this industry, and they're what I have focused my research on. Published in both Gurmukhi and the Indo-Persian scripts, and in both epic length renditions, such as these two examples. This is, on the left is Kisahir Taranjeda by Kishan Singh Arif. On the right, for those of you who can't read Shamukhi, is Kisahir Jog Singh. Uh, also, both of these are published in the late 19th century. Both of them are epic length renditions, but Kisay were also published in shorter chapbook-like texts of eight and 16 pages, ones I suspect many of you are familiar with. Now, the Punjabi literary formation of the title of my talk cohered around this Kissa tradition. By the Punjabi literary formation, I mean that group of individuals constituted through the shared practices of producing, circulating, performing, and consuming Punjabi literary texts, and Kisse in particular. I'd like to describe here a few of the literary formation's defining features. The first is that it was expansive. By that, I mean it was very inclusive. And this is principally because Kisse were both an oral and a textual tradition. In considering Kisse texts, we must take into account that they had both reading and listening publics. Colonial sources point to their circulation through print and performance and reveal remarkable heterogeneity in terms of the formation's religious, caste, class, and gender composition. Second is that the formation derived something of its self-understanding from this literary culture. That is, that the formation was marked by what we might call a mutual co-production. Individuals and communities produced texts, and texts in turn helped constitute both individual and community identity. Third, the Punjabi literary formation was not static. It was produced through active participation, whether as patron, poet, performer, or audience member. And lastly, that while the formation was imbued with a politics, a politics that we can access through the content of these texts, this never translated into political action in state arenas. And this, I would argue, is one of the most important elements of the Punjabi literary formation and suggests why it has not figured prominently in Punjab's history or the writing of Punjab's history, because that history has been overwhelmingly concerned with what I would call state-oriented political action and aspirations. Now, the Punjabi literature around which this formation cohered was not sustained in any way by the state. This actually makes Punjabi very different from contemporary, um, from other Indian vernacular literary traditions at the time, most of which were actually promoted and to some extent sustained by the colonial state. It was sustained by pleasure, certainly, but not pleasure alone. 
Its survival was rooted in devotional practices, social relations, people's vocations, and the commerce through which the Punjabi literary formation was constituted. Punjabi texts circulated in and through a web of complex relationships that gave the formation its coherence, sustained the literary tradition that was its foundation, and imbued Punjabi texts with multiple layers of meaning. And with the time that remains, let me turn to those texts. In my reading of Punjabi Kisse, I've focused on themes that emanate repeatedly from Punjabi texts over the course of time. This repetition suggests that these were issues of central importance. Now, one narrative that obviously pr pr proved a particularly fertile ground for working through issues of contemporary salience was the story Heer Ranja. Now, whatever the, the veracity of the tale depicted in Heer Ranja, the narrative has undoubtedly been an important aspect of the cultural landscape of the Punjab still at since at least the 16th century. While it circulated orally and in manuscript form, renditions of the narrative proliferated with access to printing presses in the Punjab from the 1850s onward. In the words of one late 19th century author, he Ranja served as a means to, quote, open the history of the times, end quote, suggesting that while composing within the conventions of the narrative tradition, poets were simultaneously engaging with social issues germane to their day. Now, the tale itself has a relatively simple plot, as we saw earlier. Heer and Ranja fall in love. Heer's parents refuse to accept this match for their daughter and force her to marry somebody else. By the late 19th century, the story was invariably presented as a tragedy where Heer and Ranja die, underscoring the extent of their passion for one another. Now, in examination of the spatial imagination, by which I mean a habit of understanding social relations as inherently connected to geographic spaces, represented in Heer Ranja texts will, I think, make clear that Heer Ranja is, a much more, is much more complex than the broader contours of the tale suggest. My analysis, I should add, is based on approximately 75 versions of Heer Ranja published across the Punjab in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. My name is Dido. By Zat Aranja, I have come from Takht Hazara. This formulation of name, Zat, and natal village surfaces repeatedly in He Ranja texts. Ranja articulates it most often because once he leaves his natal village, he is rep repeatedly confronted with the question of who he is. But it applies to other characters in this tale as well. Heer is often referred to as Heer Jang Seal. Indeed, these three terms are almost interchangeable. The mapping of self and community onto place in Heer Ranja texts has prompted me to ask how territory, uh, how place and territory function in these colonial era texts. And three types of representations address themselves to this question. First is the issue of how the region, how Punjab emerges in this literature. Second is the way the texts treat the relationship between persons and locality. And finally is the issue of how locality serves as the grounds for group solidarity. Now the region as a specific locale is in many ways pivotal in the Hidranja narrative tradition. It emerges in these texts less as a political geographic entity, and by that I mean it emerges less as the Punjab of British colonial administration, and more as an imagined ensemble of natal places um, within a particular topography and religious geography. Hiranja texts do not, by and large, ever name the territory in which the tale is set. Yet fundamental narrative elements, the history of its composition and of its performance, ground it in the topography and the religious landscape of the five Duabs and the Sis Sutlej territory of Northwest India. If we can refer to this latter area, the five Duabs and the Sis Sutlej territory that you see in the map here, as the region, then the region is articulated implicitly through both framing mechanisms and the narrative itself. In framing their texts, 
authors often made references to their own natal place and perhaps more significantly to figures or sources of spiritual authority. Among these, those sources paid obeisance to were very often Sufi saints whose shrines were located in the region. Saints such as Jalaluddin Bukhari, whose shrine is south of Multan at Uch, and Sheikh Farid, whose shrine is in Pak Button, figure prominently in textual invocations. But as does Guru Gobind Singh, as do a number of other figures. Now, Sufi shrines were also prominent sites of literary performance, another way in which we might understand the narrative as being inscribed in a religious landscape. Since the earliest Punjabi kissa of Hir Ranja by the poet Damodar in the early 17th century, the inclusion of certain places in the tale has been a stable feature of the narrative tradition. Without these locales, Hir Ranja ceases to be Hir Ranja. Now, there are five such locations in the story, and I've, I've shown them here on this map. Three are associated with main characters, Takht Hazara, Jhang, and Rangpur. A fourth locale is Tila Jogia, the highest peak in the Salt Range Mountains. Now, Tila Jogia is the oldest Nath Yogi Dera associated with the sect's much revered founder, Goraknath. It is also a site where Guru Nanak is said to have retreated for 40 days of meditation. In the Heer narrative tradition, it is the site of Ranja's apparent transformation into a yogi. Last, though perhaps more, most important, is the Chenab River. Now leave aside that the five rivers of this area, the Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, Bias, and Sutlej, all of which flow into the Indus, give rise to the name Punjab, the rivers are both a defining feature of the region's landscape and have historically been critical to its economy. They provided irrigation for agriculture and were the foundation of the medieval and early modern commercial economy, serving as the main north-south transportation routes moving goods and people. Now, the Chenab is the largest of these five rivers, certainly historically, and the town of Jung is on the banks of the Chenab, and it is here that the love of Heed and Ranja flourished. The banks of the Chenab, along with the other four critical locations in the tale, provide Heed Ranja's spatial armature. Composers portrayed the region through its constituent parts, and we can be sure that listeners readily recognized their region in the depiction of its secular and spiritual places. Thus, although most Hiranja texts from the colonial period or otherwise do not describe an administrative province, the narrative is suffused with references to a distinct landscape and a common set of places. If Punjab is the backdrop for the tale, then the more explicit relationship portrayed in this literature is between people and their natal places. Hiranja texts thus provide an opportunity to consider the affective ties between person and place in colonial Punjab. Three Punjabi terms are, cr are critical to my discussion of these texts, and they are this, pardes, and vatan. Now, affective ties to natal places are articulated through the use of these terms, like this and vatan. Now, referring to takht hazara or jung, for example, through the latter terms, referring to them as one's des or one's vatan, transforms them from places on the map, indeed, to places in the heart. This transformation not only points to the affective relationship between person and place, it also fuses the two so that person and place become inseparable. Or, to think of it somewhat differently, place becomes one of the important aspects of a person's identity. Now, the two characters in Hiranja most closely associated with specific, right, specific sites are Hir and Ranja themselves, right? Ranja is from Takht Hazara, and this is central to his character. Each time Ranja is asked to identify himself, he gives his native place as a form of reference, right? So, for example, in Kishan Singh Arif's 1889, Kissa Hir Te Ranja Da, Hir says to Ranja, and I quote, now tell me the truth about yourself. And the narrative continues. Ranja says to Hir, my name is Dido, by Zat Aranja, Hazara is my village, end quote. Now, Ranja's attachment to this place is best illustrated by his dismay at leaving it. 
As Ranja laments in an exchange with Heer in Khawaish Ali's 1933 rendition, titled simply Heer Ranja, and I quote, for your sake, I left my beloved homeland, and he uses the term vatan here. Various renditions portray Ranja not only lamenting this fate, but also using his lament as an attack against Heer for marrying Sedo Khera, his rival. In Fasi Niaz Ahmed's 1913 text titled Heer Niaz Ranja, Ranja says, quote, I left my beloved Takht Hazara and became your cowherd. I left my parents, my kinsmen, my clan. I sacrificed myself, end quote. Now, through the discourse of Des and Vatan in particular, we see that place is critical to a sense of self, but also to a sense of community. Here's and Ranja's attachments to place help elucidate this. The characters identify with Jung and Takht Hazara respectively, but they also describe their association to these places in terms of Des and its counterpart, Pardes and Vatan. Now, although these terms refer to territory, we all know that they're not associated with a fixed geographic entity, right? Everyone's this can be different. They are context-specific terms that demarcate belonging and difference. So while Kiranja may have been framed within the geographic confines of the Punjab, the use of these terms suggests that an affinity to locality created a, a clear sense of group solidarity as well as of difference. So Miran Shah Bahavalpuri's rendition of Hidranja provides an example of the way in which spatial imagery serves to structure the social relationships of individuals in the narrative. Now, of Ranja's journey to Jung, Bahavalpuri wrote, and I quote, he went to the homeland, the land of his beloved, and in the process became a stranger to his own land. Right? Now, all of us know that, of course, Des and Pardes figure in love poetry, not only in Punjabi, but a number of South Asian traditions. But I would argue that there's also something going on here about a relationship to place and demarcating sort of community and difference. So one finds a similar sense of demarcating difference later in the same text in an exchange between its main protagonists. He asks Ranja, quote, where have you come from? Where is your hearth? Tell me, what is your land? She asked him, what is your this? What is your vatan? End quote. Now, his sense of difference is evident in her response. She says, my homeland, O Fakir, is Chang Seal. End quote. So this difference in homeland, whether it's the, using the language of vatan or this, establishes one of the terms of Heer and Ranja's social interaction. The spatial imagination of Heer Ranja texts drew explicit boundaries between Takht Hazara and Jung, between Heer and Ranja. Now, one final excerpt indicates this unequivocally, and it is from the text Heer Hussain, which was evidently a popular text in colonial Punjab. It was first published, or the earliest text we have is from 1873, but it was published in a total of six editions between 1873 and 1928. I draw on the 1873 edition here, which had a print run of 2,100 texts. Now, the text opens with Ranja threatening to leave Jung, telling Heer to manage her own cattle. As the action ensues, Heer pleads with Ranja to remain, if for no other reason than that the cattle will not graze without him. Now, the fate of the cattle is linked to the Seal family's wealth and prestige. So here implores Ranja to stay, saying, quote, Oh, do not exercise your power over the weak and humble. Oh, the Lord is severe and uncaring, Ranja. Ranja's response reveals the way in which a spatialized understanding informs his relationship with Heer and the community among whom he lives in Jung. So he says to her, Foreigners, and he uses the term Pardesis, have no power, Heer. Why do you speak of me as the strong? In truth, this matter is about the powerful. Your family stands before the strong, seeking a suitor for you. Of course, a reference to the Keras. I have no wealth. My home is far. I tried to gain wealth, but to no avail. Without wealth, one does not find refuge. In the end, I am leaving the people of this land. I am washing my hands of you all, O Heer." End quote. 
So in framing himself as a Pardesi and here and her family as this is, Ranja points to a conceptual division between the two that is simultaneously social and spatial. It is never specified where in geographic terms the line between Takht Hazara and Jang, between Pardesi and Desi actually falls. What remains important is the way this imaginary division contributed to the social relations between people from these two localities. Now, both individual self-conception and group solidarity in these texts are crucially linked to locality. So it is important to note this emphasis on the locality rather than the region, even within a vernacular tradition that was associated with a particular area, an area I have referred to repeatedly today as Punjab. In addition to telling us something vital about the spatial imagination in this vernacular culture, I would like to consider, albeit briefly and in closing, how these representations help us rethink some of the claims in the scholarship on Indian nationalism. So let me just wrap up here. So we all know that Indian nationalism is traditionally dated to the closing decades of the 19th and the early decades of the 20th century, the same era actually as the texts I've quoted from today. As the first major anti-colonial mass movement of the 20th century, and as one of the forces that ushered in the era of decolonization, Indian nationalism has deservedly been the site of significant scholarly attention. It has also been the site of critical historical and theoretical interventions that I won't go into. But the importance and volume of both traditional and revisionist studies of nationalism across a range of academic disciplines notwithstanding, the continuing centrality of nationalism in studies of late colonial India would lead us to believe that it was a fundamentally important phenomenon in the everyday lives of Indians. The colonial era Punjabi literary formation challenges such a conclusion, pointing instead to the salience of a rather different set of affective attachments. Drawing in this, on the spatial imagination in colonial era Hiranja texts, there is little evidence of an idea of the nation, much less an affinity for it. Social life as portrayed in these texts was highly localized. Now, my analysis suggests, however, that some Indian self-conceptions and group solidarities were articulated through spatial concepts that were not national, that were actually very local. Indeed, I think it is striking that given the political context of their production, the texts I've pointed to today of Hiranja neither point to links between the local and the national nor does the nation have a tangible presence in this literary imagination. Even representations of the region, which is clearly marked by reference to a specific topographical and sacred geography, does not operate in this literature as the connective thread that binds the local to the national. The region, in other words, is not represented as a unit easily appropriable to nationalist imaginaries. Now this is not to suggest that local affinities were the only affinities that people could have. Rather, there was a sense of being grounded in a particular relationship to place, one intrinsically tied to group solidarities, and one that was still prevalent through the early 20th century, despite the disciplining mechanisms of nationalist agendas. If we examine notions of regional belonging from the standpoint offered by Punjab's vernacular culture, we can start to grasp the limited extent to which nationalist spatial reorderings had penetrated society. At the same time, Punjabi kisse provide us with a baseline from which to gauge Indian nationalism's success later in the 20th century in bringing the idea of the nation to bear alongside for some if not in place of, the affective ties people felt to local places and their regional contexts. Now, these are, of course, literary representations I have shared with you today, and one may ask how far we can take them as representations of historical truth. The answer to that question lies in the context of the production, dissemination, and consumption of Punjabi kaseh. 
the arena of Punjabi literary culture was interactive. The orality of the tradition, its continuing popularity in the late 19th and early 20th century, despite the absence of state support, and the remarkable similarity of these representations suggests that they were reflective of prevalent attitudes in the Punjabi literary formation. Put another way, it is through the careful reconstruction of the context in which these texts were composed, performed, read, and listened to, taken together with their content, that they provide critical insights into Punjab's colonial history. Thank you. <laughs>